moment. I'll make it nine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we all go. Welcome. Uh, good morning. My name's David May. So thank you for those who've come in person. And also, hopefully, um, we've got a good turnout online. So it's a bit different this one. We normally do these at Rise Home. We thought we'd come out uh, to the south of the county to talk about the really important subject how we can decarbonize our coal chain. Uh, from farm to fork and so we've got speakers today talking about um, how we can be more energy efficient and the opportunities and things we can do um, to green our supply chain and the reason for coming to south lincolnshire particularly is the food industry in lincolnshire is obviously hugely important it's one of the most important parts of the sector we're responsible for around 30 percent of all the produce that's produced in the uk and a very significant proportion of all the freight movement and the food that is in the UK supermarkets and uh, food uh, stores and restaurants will come through Lincolnshire. So it's a really important part of uh, how we can develop our sector, make it more energy efficient, will be done and led from this part of Lincolnshire. So this morning we are going to uh, hear a couple of speakers. So the first is Graham Pennell. Graham has been at Lincoln for Sorry? Uh, just, just, just encouraging you. Encouraging you. Uh, <laughs> Graham's been um, with us at Lincoln for about uh, 18 months, two years now, but formerly was at FR Perk, which was a research institute looking at refrigeration and has a deep knowledge and understanding of the food industry and refrigeration and has worked uh, in a previous life on a large refrigeration project with Tesco and the University of Lincoln on optimizing and energy efficiency. And then we're going to hear from Erin uh, Rusbridge, who is going to uh, talk about the opportunities for energy efficiency uh, from NFU Energy, how we can look to generate uh, energy and what the energy opportunities are. So for those of you who are online, um, my colleague will be picking up any questions. So if you just put those in the chat <coughs> and then we'll do a Q&A. And I think each of the speakers is going to do about 20 minutes. So Graham, I'm going to hand over to you. <coughs> Everybody moves. Morning, people. Um, I think as David, well, as David did say, because I heard him just now, I'm Graham Fernell. I'm from the National Centre for Food Manufacturing. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, submetering, particularly in food. Um, it's something that I found out that many businesses, small food businesses particularly, don't have a lot of submetering going on. And that's the first step in any understanding to improve the carbon, uh, improve the energy costs. Um, is to understand where you are. So I'm going to talk a little bit about submetering in general, and then some of the findings from real data that we that I've come across while I've been out playing, playing with lovely, lovely data. Is that the one I want? Yeah. So I'm officially a senior lecturer in agri-food cool chain, um, and also process automation. That was a previous love of mine, but that's for another uh, another time. So I've got about 40 years' experience in food R and D, um, although in the academic environment. Where I've been working is in that translation of knowledge from the academic space into the useful space where it can be picked up and used by business. And there's, and you're just sitting in that middle, the interesting bit where you've got their problems and their good ideas and trying to consolidate the two. So if you don't know much about <coughs> the University of Lincoln, I've got a pointer. Lincoln itself is about here, Lincolnshire Institute of Agri-Food Technology, where David's group and uh, Simon's around somewhere as well. Based here at Lincoln, this is the centre for the National Food Centre for Food Manufacturing down in Hull Beach, and I'm from up here in the uh, the Grimsby branch, which has started in the last year. Primarily, we're looking at a lot of seafood, but all types of uh, all types of uh, food processing. So, National Centre for Food Manufacturing, we're a big team, very diverse. But the key thing about it is we're trying to get knowledge from knowledge actually into use. And that's what drives us on. So basically, you can't control what you don't measure. And then this understanding drives down three, uh, three or four levels. First section is collecting data. Data doesn't mean anything until you start looking at it. And so many businesses collect data because uh, Salsa or BRC or whoever says, you need to collect data, but nobody looks at it. So the first thing is collect data, then start processing that data into forms you can understand. Generally, the simplest way of doing this is a plot. You don't need any dead hard sums. Excel will do it beautifully. 
Once you've got those data plots, you can then start interpreting it and getting knowledge. And when you've got enough knowledge, you get to wisdom. And when you've got wisdom, you can make good choices. So it's a case of data cascades down and you get better and you get more uh, ability to make the right choices as you, uh, as you go on. So um, in food chain, somewhere between 40 to 80% of all energy in the food sector goes into refrigeration. Refrigeration is absolutely vital in agri-food. It controls your safety, it controls your quality, it controls your shelf life. So many things rely on refrigeration, which is why refrigeration in food is, is very important. And it is a major spend. Um, we've done some recent work in the local area. And even if you don't have correct data, they say by a rule of thumb, it's somewhere between 30 and 85% goes into refrigeration in the local area, just talking to people. So these figures from, a, from academics actually are held out. And in the UK, it's two to 4% of all the greenhouse gases in the UK are associated with refrigerant emissions, which is quite a big chunk. It's going down due to F-gas regs, um, but it's still quite a sizable amount. So sub-metering. Most, well, all businesses will have a, a meter where, where you start, where the resource coming in, where the gas, water, electric comes into the business, and that's what you charge for at the end of the day. Sub-metering is further meters further down into the process where you can see how much of that resource is going to different parts of the factory or different parts of the facility at different times. So it's a more detailed form of monitoring your energy. And these are just some examples here of, uh, of sub-meters. We've got some fixed ones up here, older style in the corner. These are some water submeters. These are some tampon submeters, which I've uh, spent many a happy hour trying to get to behave in factories. Um, but that is the other thing. They don't need to be fixed equipment. You can clamp them on um, and collect data on the fly over a short period, and it gives you more understanding. So it's not a big cost initially. So I think I've covered benefits of submetering. Greater depth of knowledge, greater depth of information enables you to understand what's going on a little bit more. I've got some examples later on uh, where I can do that. You can, yeah, I, I think I've said all that really. Bottom line is greater understanding leads to reduced costs. If you're talking to funders, greater understanding leads to reduced carbon. But if you're talking to businesses, greater understanding, reduced costs. Use the right language for the right people. So. Submeters, basically you have a clamp around each of the three uh, conductors that will measure the current in that conductor. You multiply it by the voltage and you get power very, very basically. So the first sort of plot you would get out of a data from a submeter is something like this. Um, these are just the currents in each of the phases. The top three are the currents here. And just at a very simple level, that highest peak there, the blue one, that phase of the three-phase circuit is actually drawing more electricity than the other two phases. So if you're going to have any wiring go down, that's phase, that phase rather than that. Number one, phase one is the one that's going to be under greater load. Ideally, you want all those to be as close as possible. It's not always possible because you may have a three-phase three -phase supply going into a factory and you've got single-phase things on different legs of that three-phase. So it does get a bit lopsided, unbalanced. But if it gets too bad, one phase is going to fail. And that's not good because things catch fire and nasty, nasty. So very basic level, you can look at the individual currents across each phase. Another basic level, this is the one we're interested in here is this, this trace here, which is the voltage going into the factory. I was going to say all. The vast majority of electrical equipment is sized and designed to run on 220 volts, 220, 230 volts. If you are, have 240 volts going into your facility, you've got 10 volts there that you're not needing. And if you can correct your voltage down to your 220 or 230, you can actually save energy. The current's the same, the equipment will run just as well because that's designed to run on a 220. But that extra, you know, let's say 10 volts times 13 amps, you've got some more kilowatts there that you'd be paying for, but you don't actually need to make your motor go around or make your fridge cold. So voltage correction is another simple thing to do. You need to be a reasonably sized business to make it worthwhile uh, because the capital cost is not cheap. But if you're big enough, it's well worth looking at. 
Um, and at a place we worked at it's with Scunthorpe, um, it was a college actually, and they saved three hundred thousand pounds by uh, over over five years by voltage correction. It's not bad payback, and so. So one of the <coughs> benefits of submetering, beyond those basic levels of what's actually happening in your plant, is you can start digging in for understanding of how your processes affect your energy balance. At the very simplest level, um, this is a plot from a, a plot, business in Grimsby. Basically, I just got them to read their meter once a day. Read your meter once a day, and you can tell what each day is doing. Very, very, very basic. But you can see here that this day, 20th of November, substantially lower. I don't know how quick you are on your calendars, but what day of the week do you reckon that is? Saturday or Sunday. It's a Sunday. Yeah, exactly. It's a Sunday. <laughs> so you can tell that these days you've got the different energy requirements. Next stage, wash your throughput on each of those days. We know on Sunday they're not working. This is their base load. They are always going to have that load on the system. So I would hope in this case that at the end of this week, their throughput's decreasing. They had a bad day on Wednesday, and then the other days, fairly consistent throughput. Because that makes sense. If that's not the case, then you've got something. One of those processes you're using on one of these energy hungry days is a much bigger consumer than other processes on other days. So, even at the very simplest level, no extra kit, you have your energy meter, you know what you've done, you can start understanding the impact of different things. A lot of businesses are very uh, are lucky enough to have half hourly HHD data, which the, uh, the energy supplier will give you. So this is the same data, but now we're on half hourly intervals plotted out here. And you can see exactly the same thing here, Wednesday, Wednesday, Sunday is a much quieter day, but we're seeing little peaks now going up and down. And I know, I know that that's the refrigeration kit kicking in and out. There's no processing going on. When you have a defrost on the refrigeration equipment, that will give you a little spike in energy requirement. And that's what you're seeing there. So even half hourly data, you can sometimes pull out more, more information. But where it gets really interesting, I hope that's my next slide. No, it's not my next slide. Um, park that one side for where it gets really interesting. What you can also do with half hourly data is this pseudo color plot. I don't know if anybody's familiar with this as a way of analyzing half hourly data. Few nods, yeah. But for our, our 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 audience in the outside world who I can't see nodding or shaking their heads, um, this is half hourly data. We've got days up and down on the vertical axis, and then we've got each half hour through the through the 24 hour period across there. And all I've done, I've put it into Excel and I've applied a pseudo color, uh, which is I think it's conditional formatting, where the higher values get the redder numbers and the less high values get green. So it runs from red to green, a pseudo color. And from this is from a, uh, a restaurant on the Fleetthorpe seafront. Um, and what you can see here, there's several things. I'll tell you this is December. And so you can see immediately where they stopped working. So the bridge plant's still on, but it's all low energy. That's their base load. You can then start looking down through here and you can spot the weekend or the, the non-working days and you can spot the busy days where the reds come in. Those are the busy days. That's their high peak. They should be serving more, more bacon buns on those days. The other interesting thing you can see here, you can see this yellow line around here. That day, somebody left something on overnight. And you can tell from your energy plot what's happened. So you've got some historical information. So you can go and, I was going to say, beat your staff up. You can't do that. You can remind your staff to turn things off at the end of the day. Um, but it's simple information like most people have Excel. So with half hourly data, a bit more data density, you can start seeing more interesting things going on. Uh, sorry, I've, uh, I changed this presentation a little bit and I've lost, lost, lost my direction a bit. Um, so onto submetering now. This is a small production facility in Grimsby. Um, they've got a cold store and they've got three ovens that uh, are used for drying products. So we put an energy meter on each one of those four major components in their process chain. That messy plot there is the plot that you that we got out of it. This is the energy consumption 
um, at 10 minute intervals throughout the week. I know that this yellow one was on the cold store. It's covering over everything else. It's a fairly consistent load. It's on all the time. We'll forget about that for the time being. And that's what you get there. So each one of these traces now is one of those ovens. And then this green, green line is what's left between the incomer and then all the things we've measured. So that's the surplus. But what we can see here, sudden here, so this oven, the gray oven, a gray oven, a blue oven, and a orange colored oven. That gray oven, sorry, all those ovens are doing the same load, but the same throughput. But that gray oven is an older oven, and it's using substantially more energy than the other two. So as a result of this quick piece of analysis with some submeters for a couple of weeks, we, they are now loading their ovens two and three. They're using those in preference to oven number one. Some of the practical uses. Um, I'm okay, I'll, I'll, since it's here, I'll tell you about it. Um, talking about data density here, on the left-hand side, the red line is the half hourly data, the blue line, is the 10 minute interval uh, submetered data. Whilst you can see general trends in half hourly, you get a lot more detail, so you can pull out more information with the submetering at a higher data density. Uh, the plot on the right hand side is basically showing you how that changes as you change the integration period, as you reduce the width or the, you reduce the duration over which you collect data. The, uh, the resolution gets better but the absolute numbers used in each period goes down, obviously, because you're dividing it by more, more during the week. How am I doing at the time? You're all right at the moment. I'm all right. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, a, it, it, it's a marathon. It's, it's not a race. Uh, refrigeration. Um, oh, okay, our, our friends on, on the owl, I'll, I'll go through. This is a plot of energy on the red line, temperature on the blue and the uh, yellow line. This is a well-behaving refrigeration system. Uh, so the temperature in the system rises until it gets too warm, got a set point here, top point back one. Fridge plant kicks in, temperature drops. Because the fridge plant is working, the energy goes up. We now get too cold, fridge plant turns off, energy drops, temperature rises until that cycle repeats. So that's standard running. Every period for a defrost, for a refrigeration system, you need to heat up the coil, to melt the ice off the coil, and so you have something called a defrost, which is that big energy peak there. So that's a well-behaving refrigeration system. That is a bit of basic knowledge that then you can start applying on data when you start looking at it. And where the data gets really fun is when you start looking at the energy and the temperature simultaneously. You start learning lots of lovely, interesting things. So this is a Sunday in a chill store, lovely straightforward data. This is Monday, I think, yeah, Monday, a working day. They look pretty much the same, slightly more energy use as you've got more activities going on here. You think, yeah, they're close enough. But when you, when you add up that energy across the entire working day, you can see that on the working day, so we look the green line is the cumulative energy. We have, what's that? Another 10 kilowatt hours on that working day, even though it looked pretty similar, and that mounts up over time. Um, the other thing you can, when you're starting to look at energy and temperature simultaneously, you can see if your fridge plant is working too hard or not. Here, overnight, bubbles along, nice minus 20 for the store. We get into the operating day, and you can see the fridge plant is on all the time, it's at the top there and the temperatures are struggling to get back down into this lovely cycling motion. So a combination of energy and temperature shows you that fridge plant is working too hard. Either it's undersized or you put too much hot into the space. Um, peaks, you can look at peaks. This is a, what is this one? Oh, this is a fish shop. Uh, this is a fish and chip shop, three cold stores uh, on Rabbit Street in Grimsby. Bit messy data, but the point is here. Here, you can see the defrosts going, and they're all simultaneous. Because those defrosts are simultaneous, the peak overall on red is quite high. In this situation, it's not actually an issue. But if you're using a larger plant, those peaks might push you into uh, problems with the energy load, with the wiring, might push you into penalty clauses on your energy supplier. 
So here, all we did is we put those defrosts, we staggered them. And you can see a dramatic decrease in the overall peak and everything is a little more uniform because of that extra data that we had. Um, as you probably know, real data, the colder you make something, so these are degrees below ambient on the right, and then the power on the left, the colder you make something, the more energy you use. So if your set point is too cold, you're using more energy, question your set points uh, because it's costing you energy. Uh, defrosts, well, one of my uh, pet, uh, pet targets at the moment. Um, temperature across the top, uh, energy across the bottom. In this plant, we've got eight defrosts in a day, which is a lot, every three hours. Every three hours, you get an energy peak. But you can see the temperatures are good. With this understanding, you can target those situations and say, well, can we remove one of those defrosts and save some money, save some carbon? And this is what we did here. We looked at the uh, facilities in the plant. It's a small plant, but we looked at that and looked at the proportion of the time the plant was in defrost, proportion of time it was in standard running, applied an hourly cost to each of those and said, well, if the temperatures drop well, you're maintaining temperature, so that's fine. The temperature trace tells us we're good, so we can lose a defrost there. And in doing that, we were saving uh, annually, well, this one, chiller two, we couldn't do it, the fridge plant wasn't good enough. But the others, we could save money. And we saved this small business £1,000 a year on their energy bill, just by understanding that they had too many defrosts. And it also saves some carbon. If there's any funders listening, it saved us somewhere between 200 and 800 kilograms of carbon a year. So um, I, think, I think I'm going to be not down on time either. Um, this is a large processing store in Grimsby. Um, this is the period overnight from nine o'clock till six o'clock the following morning. This is what they were doing before. They just left the fridge plant on overnight. There's no processing. That all the processing finishes about nine, ten o'clock. Uh, but the accumulated energy over that six hours, nine hour period, about 180 kilowatt hours of energy overnight. <coughs> I said, well, why don't you turn it on? It's going to save you some energy. And they said, well, we can't turn it off. Everything will be, it will be warm in the morning and we'll have to work harder to pull it down. So we measured, the t we persuaded them to turn it off over <laughs> overnight and we looked at the temperature. And the temperature, yes, quite true, the temperature does pop up. But we've got enough coolers in that room. There's all the facilities in that room, all the equipment, everything that's in there has been chilled down to eight degrees. And so it sits there and it holds its temperature because there's very little extra heat going into the room. You haven't got people, you haven't got motors running, you haven't got doors opening. So temperature rises a bit, but it cools down beautifully in what, less than an hour. So, <clears throat> but all that time while that fridge plant is off, you're not using any extra energy. And that's the key thing. And so in this case, the, the business, all they had to do was change their building management system to turn the fridge plant off. And they are saving about £10,000 a year on energy. Just a simple thing, turning it off. But they have the confidence to turn it off because we had to look at temperature and energy at the same time. That's the key point. You can make some big savings with very little investment. Just by understanding what you have and how to run it. So I think I'm pretty much on time. Conclusions. They are one minute, one minute. Um, you can't improve if you don't measure it. You've got to know what you're looking at and you've got to have enough data density to be able to understand with enough depth that you can pick out the bits that are important. If you've got that understanding, you can make good choices. You don't have to spend a lot of money to save energy. Some of the low hanging fruit is just in how you operate the system. And I think I will leave it there. Um, so I'm sure we've got questions. After. We'll do questions at the end, if that's OK. Yeah. OK, well, thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank you for uh, staying. As the saying goes, thank you for coming. Thank you for staying. And I'll hand over yeah. to uh, thank you, Brian. my colleague here. Uh, and yeah, if you've got any questions, please put them in the chat. And I'll, we'll take some questions once Aaron's done his presentation from, from those in the room as well. And uh, my able assistant is uh, getting the slides up. Thank you, Brian. So welcome, Erin. So um, I was going to say in my original introduction that um, I, 
NFU Energy has a long and interesting history. Uh, and having worked with some of its predecessors, it's been an important part in actually helping the industry become more energy efficient. So I'm going to hand over to Aaron. He's going to talk about some of the work they currently do uh, on in the coal chain, but also there much more broadly in the agricultural sector. So, Aaron, thank you very much. Team. Good morning, everyone. I'm Aaron Rusbridge. I work at NFU Energy. I'm a senior engineer on the project's delivery team. Um, so day to day, what I get involved with is energy audits, feasibility studies, carbon assessments, all of that kind of thing. Um, but NFU Energy as a whole, we're a consultancy um, wholly owned by the NFU. <clears throat> and we deliver all kinds of work, any kind of bespoke consultancy and contracts and anything for all kinds of agricultural and horticultural businesses, but also um, other non-agricultural um, businesses. So this morning, I'm going to be talking a bit about improving energy efficiency in um, the cold chain and in energy supply as well. So to start off with, I guess the main uh, the biggest question is why energy efficiency? Why why do you care about um, energy? And this is a consensus from 2023, I think, um, by Coltrane Federation. And you can see that the vast majority of um, people who responded to this, this consensus say that the biggest challenge upcoming for their business is costs of energy and fuel um, in the cold chain. And it's it really has, over the last few years, become such a big, um, cost to most businesses. This is a graph which shows the last three years worth of its averaged day ahead electricity prices. Um, the blue is the, the average monthly price and then the, the black bars are the peak and the trough um, of the hourly price. So long story short, extreme volatility. Um, the reasoning behind it is partially due to the amount of renewables that we have on the UK grid. Um, they make somewhere between 30 and 50% of our total grid supply month on month. Um, and the issue with renewables is that they are inconsistent and unreliable sources of electricity. So sometimes you have an extreme glut of, of electricity on the grid and you get prices going into the negative where suppliers are paying you to, to import that power. And then conversely, um, sometimes there's no wind blowing, there's no sun and all of a sudden we're having to run fossil fuel peaking plants, um, which then ties into gas markets and geopolitical things and, and storage levels means that the gas price is not quite as volatile as, as power, but similarly as volatile. So suffice to say, the reason why electricity is so expensive is because of risk. You can see that throughout 2023, the actual average price was not that high but the variation that you were getting month on month was somewhere in the 200%, um, which is such a high risk for the suppliers that they build in those risk margins into the contracts that you pay for. So whilst the commodity cost, which is cost per kilowatt hour, is under a hundred pounds a megawatt hour, so that's um, 10 pence a kilowatt hour, the amount that you're actually paying for your contract is probably more like 25 pence. And it's just risk margins. So the real, how that affects your business is you want to try and reduce your reliance on the grid as much as possible to try and mitigate that risk. Um, and that comes in two ways. First of all is improving the efficiency, reducing the consumption of your supply. And then the other side is um, offsetting what's left with renewable generation or non-renewable self-generation. So energy efficiency at its simplest, Efficiency is just a ratio of the useful work that a system does by the total amount of work that's gone into that system. Um, and improving efficiency means either increasing the amount of useful work that comes out of a process or reducing the amount of um, total energy that's put into it um, to get the same outputs. I'll very quickly touch on the importance of data because Graham's done a brilliant job on um, highlighting a lot of the considerations there. This is monthly electricity import taken from uh, electricity bills. And whilst it's, there are some things that you can tell from this data, it's not fantastic. You can see that there's obviously there's big seasonality here. You can see that throughout those summer months, nothing really is happening, very small base load. And then you get into the sort of 20 to 30 megawatt hours per month through um, winter and some of the shoulder months. 
there's really not much more that you can say about this data. Um, this is a, a chilled potato store, by the way. Um, this is the half hourly data in, in that same pseudo pillar heat map that, that Graham was talking about. And there's so much more that you can tell from this data. I won't get too, too much into it um, because we've already heard about uh, the importance of getting granular data. But the sort of key takeaway is sometimes before you can really make a decision on improving your efficiency or investing into some improvement on your site, you really need to get more data, whether it's submeters, whether it's improving your import supply connection to be half hourly, whether it's putting some loggers on a particular piece of kit, or whether it's improving the sensors throughout your cold store so that you can see and inform your control systems a bit better. Um, and then once you've got that data, there's really good resource. This is again from the Cold Chain Federation um, 2023. What they do is collect CCA data from I think about 400 of their uh, members and they make these benchmarks for different types of um, businesses in terms of the size and the, how cold they go down to and they've got these curves of um, benchmarks. This level of data is not available for many sectors, um, particularly that I work with in, in farming, but a lot of sectors don't have data as good as this. So really, I'd, I'd recommend you to, to make the most of this resource to look at where your business stands in, this is kilowatt hours per meter cubed of storage space, and to figure out, okay, where does my business stand on this, on this curve? And what are these other businesses doing that I'm not? Why are they more efficient than I am? And then you can start to, to get more informed decisions about improvements. Ultimately, when you talk about how to improve, the most important thing that you can do is to give somebody a responsibility at your business. You need to allocate time and allocate resources into energy. It's such an important cost to the business that it is absolutely worthwhile having somebody responsible because then they can set time aside to do this analysis. Maybe it's not somebody in the business, maybe it's an external consultant, but having somebody who is actively looking at your business and looking at your energy spend um, is, is key to having any sort of meaningful improvement. Um, once you've got some sort of responsibility, creating a policy, so whether that's a target of saying you want a certain amount of reduction by a certain date, or whether it's a set of criteria financial or carbon whatever to say if a project satisfies these criteria then we're going to invest in it written into a formal policy it means that a framework is there so that when there is some project that's that's put forward there is a formal set of rules to say okay yeah we're gonna improve um, on what this is and then an action plan is a much more granular step by step this is the, the actions that we're going to do after you've got that implement some of the improvements either through getting a consultant to come in and, and recommend improvements or if you've got somebody internal with that technical expertise to start implementing improvements and then finally metering and monitoring validate those savings it's all well and good to have somebody who looks at your data once and in, implements this improvement and then doesn't look at it again and as a business how do you know that that's actually saved you the money and with energy you really need to be keeping on top of it. You can look at something and improve the process and have it very efficient. And then if you don't look at it for six months, then maybe it's not being used as it was intended. Maybe there's been some maintenance that hasn't gone on and that energy will start when it's not being looked at actively, um, it will start to creep back up. So that ongoing metering monitoring, I can't stress enough how important that is. Um, on to some more sort of practical things um, in terms of how to, to start to improve the uh, energy performance of your business. Um, that ongoing data analysis is, is a really important point. And then next, doing a walkthrough of your site is incredibly important and making notes of not only the equipment and how it's used. So sort of I've written there, nameplates. Um, there's an example of a nameplate there with the kilowatt rating on making a note of everything that's on your site. Okay, how big is this compressor? How, how many, what kilowatt demand is this piece of equipment? What control system is operating it? What are the run hours of it? All of those, you know, how is this equipment being used? And then the space itself, is the building fabric 
up to spec is the insulation on it what the current regulations on insulation say it should be is it has it been damaged is it still in in good um good condition are the doors closing all the way are the seals getting worn all of that kind of stuff looking at the behavior are the staff closing the doors when they're supposed to <laughs> is stuff being left open are set points being actively um, changed when needed how is the airflow all of that kind of stuff to, to start to build a picture of how what's the status quo currently of the site um, the next the most obvious thing that's sort of an outcome of that walkthrough um, is maintenance it is obvious i'm sure i don't need to say it to anyone who's listening um, but it's essential and it is very often overlooked obvious things like damaged or soiled fins on your evaporators um, worn seals around um, either through conveyors or um, the doors as i said before getting the doors and the curtains being aged and being worn with holes in them um, refrigerant levels inside the system is is very common to see um, not as as optimal as it should be and uncalibrated sensors if you've got temperature sensors within your cold store and they're not calibrated then you don't necessarily know that you're actually getting your product to the temperature that you're supposed to be getting it to um, and that may or may not be an energy increase or decrease but it's a product quality issue um, improving sensors within a cold store your demand is constantly changing with doors opening product coming in air moving in and out people equipment everything's introducing heat into your space and so the demand on your, your cooling system is going to change over time. Um, so having good sensors to give an idea of where the temperature is throughout your store is really important. If it's a particularly tall store, then stratification might also be an issue. If you're filling it to a certain height, then you might want sensors at multiple levels throughout the, the store um, and look into how you might um, make sure that it's cool throughout um, the product and then once you've got those sensors and once you have a better understanding of what your cold store looks like in terms of temperature then you can start to optimize the set point um, and it's a really important thing because like it says here a sort of rule of thumb it's not the case always but increasing your set point temperature by one degree can reduce the power demand from that refrigeration system by around five percent so considering refrigeration is, is probably the biggest uh, energy spend at most of these businesses that we're talking about it's really a significant um, improvement that can be made um, air infiltration is is a massive issue so there's two issues with air infiltration is that you're having to cool down the air that gets in the warm air but you're also having to cool down the moisture that comes in with that air water has a much higher um, conductivity and it has a higher uh, thermal capacity than air so the amount of energy that's needed to cool down that water is significant and then depending on the temperature of your store if you're freezing that water then there's extra latent energy that's being used by your cooling system that you're paying for that's not helping to cool your product so minimizing the air infiltration whether that's your doors or your docks um, appropriately sizing it, making sure that there's some kind of automated system that is fast to close, and there's some sort of smart controls. If it's a large door and you need that for a certain piece of equipment, but most of the time it's just a forklift running small pallets in and out, then you can have some control that will only open the door to the height that's necessary for the task that's being done. Um, and of course, making sure it's well insulated. Um, same thing with docks, making sure that they seal properly um, for loading and unloading and it only opens when product is being moved. Um, the amount of issues that come from air infiltration can't really be understated. Um, this is an example, ice builder. So you can see in this, this uh, frozen store, warm wet air has been coming into this, this store and building up icicles and all over the ceiling, the evaporator unit is um, icing up, which makes it a lot less efficient. Um, you can't see that well in this picture, but around at the back here, where the weight of that ice is sort of pulling down on the panels, they're starting to deform. And over time, that's going to, to damage them and make them less um, thermally uh, protective. But it's going to need replacing. That's an extra cost. This, is, this store is going to be out of use whilst that's happening. 
Um, interestingly as well, on a bit of a side note, you can see that around the light fixtures, the ice has melted. Um, so that's another issue in terms of lighting that, that I'll, I think I'll mention a bit later in this presentation. But these are some of the issues that you get um, with air infiltration that um, really needs to be addressed. And something like this, you'd see on, on a walkthrough um, and yeah, something that, that absolutely worth looking into. Uh, maintaining the fabric, again, if there's any gaps or, or damaged panels, then ambient air and moisture is getting in. Um, if moisture gets inside the core of the panel um, or if ice gets inside the core of the panel, then the amount of insulative um, property of that panel is gonna be significantly reduced. Um, thank you. Um, and so with your, your fabric, it's internally and externally, has some of your equipment sort of damaged it, knocked into the side, is there a hole that's formed? Um, and sometimes you won't always see that with a visual inspection. So thermal imaging can be a really useful tool to look at your store. And if you see heat around the seams of the panels or heat through a particular area of the panel, then you can see something has damaged the panel and you can start to, um, to address that. Um, lighting, it's a dead easy one. Um, I'm sure everybody's heard that LEDs are much more efficient than conventional fluorescence or sodium panels or uh, fixtures. So as well as they use a lot less power to produce the same levels of light, they respond much better to controls so they can have timers and sensors and they manage that a lot better. Their lifetime is significantly longer. They produce less heat into your store which means that your cooling system has to work less hard to remove that heat. Um, they really are a no-brainer. Previously, before the energy market did what it did, um, LEDs were the sort of thing, if your current fixtures failed, then replace them with LEDs. Nowadays, with energy being as expensive as it is, immediately replace any lighting that you've got with LEDs. Almost every case, it will have a payback within one or two years, um, obviously. Don't do that without without uh, consulting somebody uh, to do the maths, but almost certainly LED replacements is, is worth doing. Um, variable speed drives, I won't get too far into to how they work, but essentially they adjust the frequency of a motor to match its demand. As I was saying before, the demand on your system is gonna be varying over time significantly. Um, and VSDs on the fans, on the units, but also on the pumps and the um, compressors, can uh, reduce um, your energy spend somewhere in the 20 to 45%. Um, it'll vary depending on the type of uh, motor that you're fitting it to, but absolutely VSDs are worth looking at. Um, and then finally, once you've done all of those performance improvements, reduced your supply as much as you can and made your <laughs> system as efficient as possible, you can start to think about offsetting with renewable generation. Um, the key considerations that I've put up here the most important one is grid connection, and it is the most difficult one. Um, there are ways to get around it. So one of them, export limitations. So that's where you have a piece of kit which either limits the amount of export that you're able to do, or it completely removes that. And that makes it much easier to get a grid connection. The, the grid will be happy for you to install a PV system or any renewable system with export limitation because they don't need the infrastructure to support that export. It does mean that your system isn't able to export, so it needs to be sized appropriately. Um, but export limitations is the easiest, simplest way to get, get an approval on a grid connection. Um, private wires is another way. It's a little bit more extreme. You have to sort of invest in that infrastructure to wire electricity physically to a nearby site. Um, but if the cost to connect to the grid is high enough and it, it can get into the the very high figures, um, depending on how much upgrades need to be done on the grid, it can be economical to instead wire that electricity directly to a nearby business. Um, and then island mode is again a bit more extreme and you need to do some um, more electrical uh, figuring out of it, but running a system so it's isolated from the grid, it never contacts the grid at all, then you don't need a grid connection. Um, the next consideration I spoke about is self-use. So again, appropriately sizing your um, your system is, is the biggest uh, way that you can improve your self-use. Anytime that you export power to the grid, 
maybe you'll be getting paid 12 pence a unit if you're lucky. Whereas if you're importing, it's more like 25 pence. So to make the most out of your system, you really want to be using as much power yourself. Um, and whether that's load shifting or whether that's storage, um, however you, you maximize your self-use, that's a, a key consideration. And then finally, planning permissions. Certain technologies don't need it. Um, rooftop solar doesn't need it. But if we talk about wind, it's historically very difficult to get planning permission. The rules have changed slightly in September last year. Um, there were some changes that make it easier to get planning permission for wind. Um, but the key to making that work is community engagement, whether it's selling some power locally on PPA at a favorable rate, or whether it's some sort of education initiative, getting that community engagement is a really important part to obtaining planning permission. I think this is my last slide. Um, a little bit on solar PV. I've said that because it's it's the most uh, sort of viable option in most of the sort of storage applications. Um, this is how PV generates throughout the year. Um, like I said, roof mounted doesn't need planning. It's a very mature technology. It's quite cheap for the kilowatt rating that you get compared to other um, options. And it can have other benefits other than just producing power for your site. The reducing thermal gains through the roof um, may be something important, uh, which PV systems do. Um, if there are any, um, if there is any interest, thank you very much for listening. If there's any interest in that kind of thing in, in um, feasibility studies or energy audits, um, NFU Energy also runs what's called the Renewable Energy Solutions Service, RES, um, where we'd pair a client with one of our partnered installers and sort of do technical checks and make sure that um, the pricing and the what the installers are suggesting is is fair and suitable for the site that you're on um, and yeah if you're interested in any of that then come and find me or, or one of my colleagues after this talk thank you very much thank you very much Aaron. uh that's really good thank you and thank you to Ryan as well so apologies for that so um i'm gonna ask tyler if do we have any online questions first so everyone's very happy but we've not got any questions okay in the online chat Right, well, I, I'm, perhaps if Erin and Graham want to come up, uh, I'll take some questions from you all. And whilst you're thinking about that, um, I will perhaps pose the first one, which is um, on your slide earlier, and you there was a broad disparate uh, range of operating efficiencies effectively across those coal stores. Mm -hmm. So at what point does it become more cost effective to either replace or rebuild that? Because often coal stores are panel buildings within existing buildings. So uh, uh, how long is the lifespan? Uh, and are people just basically hanging <coughs> on in the hope that to put it in that place? It's a good question. Um, it's not an easy answer to that. There isn't a sort of cut off point to say, once it gets to a certain age, you need to tear it down and replace it. Um, I think it's, the key point is measuring what your performance is. And if you're comparing against the benchmarks and you made all of the improvements that you can reasonably make to your system and you're still above the existing benchmarks for similar businesses then that might tell you okay it's going to be more economically beneficial for me to just replace my system at this point um but yeah so it's about that working through the process and coming to a number so i have i mean in my retail days have been involved simon do you have a question yeah so so i mean now to the energy coming up, I like the graph with the variance in the energy price, that's really interesting, it's really in the spines. Um, what you see in the market reaction is to that, so are you seeing massive reinvestment now in new plants, ice out systems, off gas? Uh, so you start to see that return or is it just taking a bit of time? The difficulty at the moment is electricity costs have spiked quite high. Gas has also been expensive, but not quite at the same rate. So there's still quite a good spark spread for CHP operation. As well, the um, standing charge changes, so uh, the Tenuos changes for capacity charge, and um, there's another one coming in soon, the targeted charge review, TCR, is all living against electricity, because that extra money, the grid is going to try and invest it into upgrading infrastructure. But it means that the cost 
for an electricity connection has increased a lot and it is going to increase again come April when TCR comes in. So the difficulty is it needs to be economic and most businesses, at least that I work with, just run natural gas CHP because they can export power and make decent money off of it. But the relative costs for their gas connection versus electricity connection means that it doesn't make sense for them to, to rely on an electrical based heating system at the moment. Um, it's really difficult to, yeah, it's, it runs counter to the sort of decarbonisation message that the government is pushing at the moment because it, economically it doesn't make sense. Mm. And, but I'm not sure if that answered your question or not. No, it's just really interesting. It's very, yeah, very, very it's a good answer. Um, but think about big glasshouse projects then, where you've got industrial plants which might waste it. Have you seen that movie, or is that the same? Yeah, it's still stick with CHB because it's still got CO2 from the CHB as well. Yeah, that's the difficult part. CO2 is so expensive. So, with most of these liquid CO2, the pure CO2, we get from um, a few very big um, fertilizer manufacturing plants, and those work using natural gas and when natural gas got very expensive a couple of years ago, a couple of those shut down. So the supply of pure CO2 means um, it's very expensive to run. So not running a gas boiler or a gas EHP at a horticultural site that needs CO2 is a bit unpalatable at the moment without some sort of incentive like an old RHI heat pump system. Thank you. I think we've got a question online. We do, yes. So Stephanie Bishop asks, have you got any figures on how much benefit solar panels have to insulation? Karen, I think that might be one for you. Mm. I'm sure those <laughs> figures exist. Not on the top of my head, um, but I can get some numbers and get back to you. And I think the other thing, just on, on that, also it'd be helpful to understand about the suitability, because I believe a lot of the panels are getting lighter. Mm. So actually, the build the sorts of buildings that can take those panels may have changed. Yeah. So so actually, it may be it may bring into scope other buildings that you might have previously have discounted. Martin, I think you've got a question. Well, two or three questions about sort of the <coughs> investment case, the structural case, those sorts of issues. Um, it always strikes me that what we tend to do in the past is you build up to the specification at the time you build. You don't then retrofit from the insulation point of view thermal mass point of view, all of which can help to smooth out those peaks in demand. Um, what is the business case to actually go in on a retrofit basis, improve the insulation, improve the thermal mass, um, improve door controls? Uh, with energy costs where they are now, do those sorts of things make sense? I think it's a case by case thing. Sometimes it will, it really comes down to you need to, to do the maths, build a model or get your sensors to a point where you can meter okay what is my spend right now how what how much energy am i losing through this structure and how much energy how much less would i be losing if i retrofitted and do the cost balance on it it's a case by case thing. so i can so I'll, I'll come back and let you ask the second one so i know when i worked in retail we put in a lot of monitoring very cheaply but it allowed us to save significant amounts because of door opening door disciplines that was a big warehouse ASDA, who I didn't work for, but they also published some data. I think at the time, this would be back in the early 2000s, they reckon they saved about 12% of their energy just by better door control. If you think about a big retail warehouse, <laughs> they are big warehouses. I mean, they can be about a kilometre long, some of them, but actually that door control was a big, big issue. So I think, yes, I agree it's case by case, but actually, some simple things and culture about not leaving the doors open because it's easier for the driver to put pallets in and out is a good thing. There's lots of other reasons for doing it um, as well as that. So, sorry, Martin, you had another question. Well, the other the other question was you raised the issue about the temperature that you try to store at. And we've been speaking to some other people in the sector who've been making the same point. Um, and there does appear to be some work that's being done saying, well, maybe the temperature that we're storing at, at the moment is just because that's what we've always done in the past. We come up maybe three, three to four degrees, which on your sort of one degree equals five percent, fifteen to twenty percent saving. Um, what do we actually need to do to make that change? Because we can make that change across the whole of the sector. The amount we could save, both from carbon and cost point of view, would be very, very substantial. 
Do you want me to answer, try and answer that one? Yeah. There's a former yeah. retail techie, and there's another. There's two other retail techies in the room, so I'm not going to embarrass them by asking them their point of view. I think the work you're referring to has been done on frozen foods. Yeah. So historically, um, my zero F minus 18 has been the standard. Lots of retailers, and, I, and I've worked with one and done work with others, will say effectively that needs to be probably minus 20 or minus 21 coming in on the vehicles. Their long-term storage, certainly when I was first in retail, we were doing minus 25 for long-term storage. So actually, I think there's a, the industry needs to be confident that the, the research that Camden and Nomad have done is good. And I think you know, there's no reason to doubt what, what they've done and that it works for everything, particularly ice cream, which is obviously been one of the ones which has affected people's perception of what's good. So I think if the industry and the frozen food sector gets behind it and agrees that's the standard, I think then the retailers will be convinced uh, to change their systems because it's in their interest to do so. I think the challenge is that people are technical tend to be quite conservative about things which affect food safety. You'd like to comment further, Si? Right? <laughs> so actually it's uh, having that body of evidence. I think in fresh produce, I think it's slightly different because actually there's an opportunity by having colder to increase shelf life and that gives you a benefit. So if you store mushrooms at about eight degrees, they will last probably two days or less than if you have them at nine, uh, sorry, at five degrees. So actually it makes a huge difference to shelf life and of course that has an impact as well. So, so it's, I think, different scenarios in different sectors, but I think the frozen food one um, will be about convincing the retailers and the technical community within the frozen food sector that it's just, it's the right thing to do and we can move and I suspect it will be gradual and some retailers will move faster than others. Um, and I know there is differences in what retailers are doing already uh, because of perception of risk. I, I would add something into that as well. We also need to convince the FSA and the environmental health people that minus 15, let's say, is, is safe. So interestingly, there is nothing in the law mm -hmm. that says it has to be minus 18, because I did a review of it yeah. a few years ago. The only figure stated is minus 12 for quick frozen from memory yeah. uh, and I don't believe the law's changed since I reviewed it in 2018. So from, from experience though, I know EHOs can be individuals with a lot of power uh, and if their perception is such then that is the law in your particular area. Todd, have we got any more online questions? Yep. Okay, well I think we, because we've only got a couple of minutes, I'd like to thank our guests, speakers for coming today. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd also like to thank those of you who came to Spalding, so coming on the road was a bit of a, a different way of doing it. Hopefully we've had a few new faces and, and we brought an interesting and important topic. Uh, and clearly if you'd like uh, as a business or an organisation to know more about the work that we do at Lincoln or more about the work that NFU Energy does, please get in touch. This will be available on YouTube uh, and through social media so that we'll promote it. It's a really important topic, particularly for Lincolnshire. Uh, and I know the left are very keen that we coalesce around that, but it's also more important uh, for the broader industry as well across the whole of the UK. So thank you very much for listening and thank you for coming. Thank you.